There's a book about Buddhism I saw one time called The Intelligent Heart. And that concept is a really good summary of why we respect the Buddha. You probably notice we bow down to the Buddha a lot around here, show him a lot of respect, because that's, it's because he shows us the way to show respect to something really worthy of respect within ourselves, which is our desire for true happiness. That desire is an affair of the heart. And he also teaches us to be intelligent about it. The intelligence here comes under the framework of seeing things in terms of cause and effect. In other words, you simply don't go by your desires, by your urges, in your search for happiness. You look to see what really does give rise to true happiness. And then you adjust your behavior accordingly. You might say the Buddha has us take our happiness seriously, not in the sense of being grim about it, but you would think if something is so important to the heart that we really would look carefully at what really causes happiness and what doesn't. And for so many people in the world, they simply go along with the crowd. They see other people looking for happiness and wealth and relationships and status. And they figure that must be where it is. They don't really look that carefully to see, are these people really happy? You want to look around and look through the, the PR. Look beneath the surface to see who out there really is a good example of how you find happiness, how you find genuine happiness. But that's the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom begins by going and finding people who look like they really know. As the Buddha said, contemplatives, people who've been contemplating their life and living a very deliberate life, living their lives wisely. And you ask them, what when I do it will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness? What when I do it will lead to my long-term suffering and harm? This question is wise, not only because you're asking you know, the right people, but also because you see that your happiness depends on your actions. And that long-term is better than short-term. There's another principle the Buddha teaches, that if you see that there's a greater happiness that comes from abandoning a lesser happiness, you should be willing to abandon that lesser happiness for the sake of the greater one. Sounds like a no-brainer, but most of us aren't no-brainers when it comes to affairs of happiness. We have to learn how to put our head and our heart together and realize that happiness doesn't mean simply piling up as many pleasures as you can, because there are a lot of pleasures there that get in the way of a really deeper happiness. You have to make a choice. There are some things you have to give up. It's like playing chess. If you want to win the game, you have to be willing to lose a fair number of your pieces. If you want to win at chess and keep all your pieces at the same time, you'll never get anywhere. So part of the wisdom lies in seeing which things have to be given up. There are many things that we don't want to give up because they give immediate gratification for the sake of what seems uncertain down the line. But you have to realize a lot of that immediate gratification brings a lot of pain with it, a lot of suffering, either because it is so short-lived and you want to keep grabbing after it even as it's going away, and also because we do a lot of unskillful things in order to get that short-lived happiness. 
So we end up losing in both ways. You got the memory of the unskillful actions we did together with the memory of the pa past pleasure that's gone away. It's when you realize that the long-term happiness, the happiness that doesn't harm you, doesn't harm anybody else, that's worth a lot of sacrifice. But it's not just sacrifice in the sense of having to go without, go without, and then finally hope for a reward at the end. The path that we practice here, getting the mind to settle down, be at ease with the breath, find a sense of well-being inside. That's our food on the path that keeps us going. We find that simply by focusing on the breath in a way that's comfortable and allows, allows the mind to settle down and feel at home in the present moment, that right there is a huge, a huge thing. Because there's so many people who can't do that, either out of regret for what they've done in the past or just simple unwillingness to look carefully at what's going on in the present moment. They're always running around, running around, running around, and having nothing to show for it, really. So it's an important investment to take the time to get to know your breath, get to know the body in the present moment in a way that allows you to settle down. When the mind settles down, it has a greater sense of spaciousness. That sense of spaciousness is something you can't buy. So we work on this, and we find that it enables us to give up a lot of other pleasures that we ordinarily would think we couldn't do without. So the training of the mind right here, as the Buddha said, is the primary requisite for happiness, a happiness that lasts. Both because it gives you the strength to give up the other pleasures that are going to leave wounds on the mind, and because it allows you to see more clearly into your own mind. When the mind feels an urge to go off someplace else, what's causing that? All too often we don't look carefully at it, we just go, go, go. Well, why? What's pushing us out of the present moment? If you can develop a sense of ease with the breath, it puts you in a position where you can see that happening and you begin to understand, oh, it's really very tiny things. And given that sense of space and well-being that comes from staying with the breath, you're less likely to get pushed off by those little tiny things. This comes down to, as the Buddha said, is the, what he calls the difference between a wise person and a fool is that the wise person sees that true happiness has to come from training the mind. The pleasures you get when your mind is not trained can actually work to your own detriment. You can get very foolish around them. And what you end up doing is turning those pleasures into pain. A much more important skill is learning how to turn pain into pleasure. In other words, sitting here with a sense of well-being that comes from the breath, even though it may not be totally filling everything in your body and mind, at least gives you a, a toehold in the present moment. And then you can look at the things that otherwise would push you out, either pains in the body or uncomfortable thoughts that come up in the mind. When you develop this sense of space around them, you can watch them. You can step back from them, learn about where they're coming from, see how the mind creates a lot of suffering around them, and how it can learn how not to do that. We begin with a simple exercise with the breathing. You sit down and take a survey of your body. 
if you haven't been meditating. And you're probably finding, well, there's a pain here and there's a little ache there. This is not comfortable. That feels tense. That feels tight. So instead of running away from those things, you decide to let your awareness settle down around them. Let the breath gently work on them. And you find that you can dissolve a lot of that stuff away simply by being patient with it and watching it. Even though that's not the end of suffering, you gain more confidence that you can handle these things. You don't have to get pushed out by the pain. And because you're not pushed out by the pain, you don't go thirsting after little minor pleasures. You learn to develop an appreciation for the well-being of a spacious heart and a spacious mind. The kind, <clears throat> the kind of mind that's not pushed around by things. That doesn't get blown away either by pleasure or pain. The Buddha said that one of the most important skills you can develop is that you're not overpowered by pleasure and you're not overpowered by pain. The mind develops a solidity. that enables it to stay right here and not get pushed around. Ordinarily would say, well, it doesn't matter about being overwhelmed by pleasure. That's a good thing. Well, no, it's not, because you get forgetful and you get sloppy. And when you get sloppy, then the pain comes in, and then you're totally at a loss. And the simple fact that the mind gets pushed around by these things, that right there involves a lot of stress, a lot of strain. So you want to develop this ability to be here solidly. And these things can wash around you, but they don't penetrate. There's a great sense of well-being that comes from that. You develop a sense that you can trust yourself. And that ability to trust yourself is priceless. That too is a kind of happiness that can come only by appreciating it. not letting yourself get pushed around by less, lesser pleasures and lesser pains. So this is the nature of the intelligent heart. The one that goes for the big price, a true happiness that's totally unconditioned. What we've talked about here, the pleasure of concentration, that is conditioned. But it's a lot stronger and a lot more reliable than the ordinary pleasures. They're advertised at us all the time. And it provides the opening for us to see deeper into the mind, to see something that's not conditioned. It's another dimension entirely. It's actually outside of space and time in every sense. That's where the ultimate happiness lies, the ultimate well-being. It may seem far away, but it's, it's really not. It's going to be found right here where you're aware of your body, where you have this awareness in the present moment. To try to t cultivate your appreciation of the well-being that comes from this. Because in and of itself, it's a much greater pleasure than the ordinary pleasures around us, and it gives us access to something even bigger. This is what comes from taking the issue of happiness seriously. And sticking with your determination not to settle for anything less than happiness that's totally reliable. And that enables you to become totally reliable as well.